In the last episode, we looked at the very unique euphorbias of Madagascar, but today I promised it was going to be all about the cordisiform plants. And so let's not delay, let's have a look at these remarkable fat plants and just how different they are on this very isolated island. Here we go. Let's start our journey into the Pachycol and Cordisiform plants of Madagascar by looking at an absolute icon of the island. I am speaking about Adansonia grandidieri, the famous baobab trees of Madagascar. These are instantly recognizable. You see them in every single travel video about the island. And they are those towering fat trunk trees that stand over everything, I suppose. Not only do they look amazing, but they're also widely used by the people of Madagascar. Their fruits are edible and rich in vitamin C, and their bark can be stripped off without hurting the plant, mind you, and used in all sorts of fibrous constructions like rope and the like quite remarkable. They are unfortunately endangered. I've never grown one. I don't know much about growing them just because they need so much size and they don't really start putting on that girth until they're much older. Add to that, getting them to germinate from seed is also supposed to be something of a challenge. Put that all together and it's just not something that I've got any experience with. But there are plenty of Pachycol and Cordisiform plants from Madagascar that I know plenty about. So let's have a look at some of those now. Now there's a group of plants that I know you guys can't get enough of, and that of course is the Pachypodiums. I'm not going to go into too much depth here. You can go and check out my full video on Pachypodiums if you want the full richness of the genus. But let's talk about two of them. The first is Pachypodium rosulatum subspecies gracilius. You can see this is a little seedling, and this is defined by its classical flask-like shape. Of course, that flask-like shape is really all about maintaining and holding water to enable it to survive long periods of drought. Where it grows in Madagascar, very little winter rainfall whatsoever. It also, I suppose, has the very unfortunate distinction of being, in my opinion, one of the most commonly poached plants that you'll find in the market. You'll find in East Asia, especially Japan, Korea, there are millions and millions of poached Pachypodium gracilius plants, all just sitting there, ripped out of habitat, ready for someone who knows absolutely nothing about them to take them and put them in their living room as a specimen plant, where after maybe a year, maybe two years, they'll be dead, and maybe they'll go out and buy another one because they're regarded almost as little status symbols over there. Why? I don't know. Get your hands out of our habitats, I say. Grow plants from seed if you want one. Sure, it takes patience. Patience is a virtue. I'm doing so much to hold back from launching into a string of expletives right now. Now, another plant that I want to share with you, just because, well, it's so weird and I got a lot of interesting feedback. This one is Pachypodium brevicol. I did show you me repotting this plant in that Pachypodium video. It grows in a really acidic, surprisingly kind of peaty soil. And I'm happy to report in an update, this one is thriving, noticeably fatter. It's not dead yet. These things, they like to die at the drop of the hat. Anyway, absolutely bizarre plants. They grow on granitic outcrops and they look almost like, I don't know, some kind of melted substance all over the rocks where a few leaves and bright yellow flowers emerge. Truly one of the most alien plants you'll ever see in your life. Like I said, if you want to see more about Pachypodiums, check out my Pachypodium video. Let's talk about some other truly bizarre Cordex plants now though. Now if you'd asked me about impatiens, once upon a time I would have said, they're the sorts of plants that my grandmother would grow. You know, delicate bright flowers, those thick juicy stems. Fantastic, but certainly not like anything I ever would have in this sort of space. That was until I met the Impatience tuberosa. And you can see, this is a true cordisiform plant. The base is almost like a rock, it's so woody. And from that cordisiform base emerge these, well, fairly typical 
impatient stems. The height of summer, beautiful bright pink flowers. And then when winter comes around, it'll actually drop the stems. They'll fall off and it'll start to go into dormancy. Still needs a bit of water though over the winter time. They're ridiculously thirsty plants. Anytime the temperature in here hits about 35 degrees Celsius, all the stems start to wilt. They're like, water me, water me, we're so sad. It's fairly pathetic, really. And you can see that root mass emerging out of the bottom of the pot. Didn't even know that was there until I picked it up just before. But clearly this needs a little bit more space. Anyway, truly remarkable plants. I've heard some people trying to grow these from cuttings, snipping off a stem, dip it in the water, just like you would any other impatience, and they will grow roots. But, allegedly, and I've never tried this for myself, they don't grow a cortex, so what's the point? Anyway, let's get back and look at a few more, I suppose, typical cordiciform plants, shall we? Starting with some adenias. Now, adenias are in the Passifloraceae family, related to your passion fruits, and essentially their growth form is like a vining plant. They send out shoots all over the place, but it all comes from a very fat, thickened base. This one is a Denia stylosa, beautiful plant. It's about two years old from seed, and you can see it's already starting to get that nice thickened base of the stem. Over time, this will continue to expand. It'll turn almost like really warty and ridgy and sort of grotesque. Some would say it'll be hideous. For me, beauty's in the eye of the beholder. I think it'll be quite beautiful. And the lovely thing about this plant is just the really interesting shape and color of the leaves, a very deep green with almost an orange undertone. Quite stunning. But I wanna share with you now what is one of the prides of my collection. Some of the most beautiful plants, I think, that are in cultivation today. A little pair of what are called Adenia metamorpha. And they are absolutely stunning. Just get a load of those leaves. Words don't do it justice. Now, these plants also very, very young, and they will get quite a thick, very rounded base. True cortex in every way. Why are they called metamorpha? Well, they'll actually change their growth habit over time. They'll start off as this kind of low growing, almost shrub with these remarkable leaves. And as they get older, they transform also into a vining plant, kind of trailing everywhere. And uh, their leaves at that stage, apparently, I haven't actually seen it with my own eyes, but apparently aren't nearly as stunning as these. Even so, these are some of the most prized plants in my collection. I absolutely love them, can't get enough of them. And I'm sure you can't either. Now with a fairly similar growth form to the Adenias, you've got the Cyphostemmas, members of the Batashi family, related to grapes. This one here is Cyphostemma elephantopus, and at this point in its life, not a whole lot to look at. It's just a vine. But that's because almost all the fun is happening beneath the soil line, where these very thick, tuberous roots are coiling all around in a fantastic sculptural display. Why not get the roots up above the soil? Because as soon as I do, they'll stop growing. So again, patience is key. Wait enough time and you get a true specimen plant, but you don't want to go off too early. There is another species very closely related, which I don't have in my collection right now, also called Cyphostemma montagnacii. Really quite similar to this one, but it's got a fatter base and the leaves are a little bit different. But I'm sure you'll agree, both of these Cyphostemmas are quite worth adding to any collection. You know, I've got one more species I want to share with you. Quite a curiosity, and well, it's remarkable in how different it is from everything else. But also, I suppose, in some of the similarities it shares with some other plants that we should be very familiar with. Cacti. Let's check it out. Now, there's a family of plants from Madagascar called the Didieraceae family. Some of them are pachycol or cordiciform. Some of them are just stem succulent. You might be familiar with one of them. They call it the Madagascan Ocotillo, Aluaudia procera, kind of like a stem that grows up 
with covered in spines and little leaves emerging out of the trunk. Fantastic plant, don't have one to share with you today unfortunately. But what I do want to share with you is this little seedling. This is Didieria madagascariensis, sometimes called the octopus plant because it's covered in these kind of succulent leaves that emerge all over the place like octopus tentacles. The other fantastic thing about this plant is it is absolutely covered in spines and a little bit like our Euphorbia gilauminiana that I shared with you before, this is a plant that grows in those more open, sunny, arid habitats of Madagascar. Form of protection, fantastic. But the truly remarkable thing about the Didieraceae family and why I wanted to talk about it in isolation is that they are actually quite closely related to cacti. In fact, so closely related that you can actually graft cacti onto plants like this one and vice versa, and it works. Anyone who's done any grafting before will know you have to keep within the family. You cannot, for example, graft a euphorbia onto a cactus. And so, to me, it's pretty incredible that this plant that comes from a location so utterly isolated from the rest of the world on the other side of the planet is close enough related, for example, to a trichocereus that in theory I could connect it to and they'd grow quite happily. One of these days I'll give that experiment a try. But that's the Didieraceae family for you. And it just shows how remarkably old these plants are. When you've got an island that's 88 million years removed from the rest of the planet, and yet its closest living relatives coming from the Americas, well, we're working on a different time scale indeed. Anyway, that's the plants of Madagascar. I hope it's been interesting. I hope you've seen something a little bit different and you may be inspired to try to grow some of these plants for yourself. If you've enjoyed what you've seen, you can always support me. I've got t-shirts like this one or the Scary Cactus logo as well, available on the link at the top of the page right there. If you don't subscribe, hit the subscribe button because I'd love you to join me on this journey more regularly. Anyway, that's it for today. Happy growing and uh, I'm going to go melt in this heat. See you next time.